Chapter One of Callista. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carol Pelster. Callista by John Henry Newman. Chapter One. Love thy God and love Him only, and thy breast will ne'er be lonely in that one great spirit meet all things mighty grave and sweet vainly strives the soul to mingle with a being of our kind vainly hearts with hearts are twined for the deepest still is single an impalpable resistance holds like natures still at distance mortal love that holy one or dwell for i alone De Vere. to henry william wilberforce to you alone who have known me so long and who love me so well could i venture to offer a trifle like this but you will recognize the author in his work and take pleasure in the recognition j h m chapter one sicca venaria in no province of the vast roman empire as it existed in the middle of the third century did nature wear a richer or a more joyous garb than she displayed in proconsular africa a territory of which carthage was the metropolis and sicca might be considered the centre the latter city which was the seat of a roman colony lay upon a precipitous or steep bank which led up along a chain of hills to a mountainous track in the direction of the north and east in striking contrast with this wild and barren region was the view presented by the west and south where for many miles stretched a smiling champaign exuberantly wooded and varied with a thousand hues till it was terminated at length by the successive tiers of the atlas and the dim and fantastic forms of the numidian mountains the immediate neighborhood of the city was occupied by gardens vineyards cornfields and meadows crossed or encircled here by noble avenues of trees or the remains of primeval forests there by the clustering groves which wealth and luxury had created this spacious plain though level when compared with the northern heights by which the city was backed and the peaks and crags which skirted the southern and western horizon was discovered as light and shadow travelled with the sun to be diversified with hill and dale upland and hollow while orange gardens orchards olive and palm plantations held their appropriate sites on the slopes or the bottoms through the mass of green which extended still more thickly from the west round to the north might be seen at intervals two solid causeways tracking their persevering course to the mediterranean coast the one to the ancient rival of rome the other to hippo regius in numidia tourists might have complained of the absence of water from the scene but the native peasant would have explained to them that the eye alone had reason to be discontented and that the thick foliage and the uneven surface did but conceal what mother earth with no niggard bounty supplied the bagratus issuing from the spurs of the atlas made up in depth what it wanted in breadth of bed and ploughed the rich and yielding mould with its rapid stream till after passing sicca in its way it fell into the sea near carthage it was but the largest of a multitude of others most of them tributaries to it deepening as much as they increased it while channels have been cut from the larger rills for the irrigation of the open land brooks which sprang up in the gravel which lay against the hills had been artificially banked with cut stones or paved with pebbles and where neither springs nor rivulets were to be found wells had been dug sometimes to the vast depth of as much as two hundred fathoms with such effect that the spurting column of water had in some instances drowned the zealous workmen who had been the first to reach it and while such were the resources of less favoured localities or seasons profuse rains descended over the whole region for one half of the year and the thick summer dews compensated by night for the daily tribute extorted by an african sun 
At various distances over the undulating surface and through the woods were seen the villas and the hamlets of that happy land. It was an age when the pride of architecture had been indulged to the full. Edifices, public and private, mansions and temples, ran off far away from each market town or borough as from a centre, some of stone or marble, but most of them of that composite of fine earth, rammed tight by means of frames, for which the Saracens were afterwards famous, and of which specimens remain to this day as hard in surface, as sharp at the angles, as when they first were finished. Every here and there, on hill or crag, crowned with basilicas and temples, radiant in the sun, might be seen the cities of the province, or of its neighborhood, Tibersicumber, Tuga, Larabas, Siguesa, Supatula, and many others, while in the far distance, on an elevated table-land under the atlas, might be discerned the Colonia Skeletana, famous about fifty years before the date of which we write, for the martyrdom of Speratus and his companions, who were beheaded at the order of the proconsul, for refusing to swear by the genius of Rome and the emperor. If the spectator now takes his stand, not in Sicca itself, but about a quarter of a mile to the southeast, on the hill or knoll on which was placed the cottage of Agellius, the city itself will enter into the picture. Its name, Sicca Venaria, if it be derived, as some suppose, from the Succa Vena, or Tents of the Daughters, mentioned by the inspired writer as an object of pagan worship in Samaria, shows that it owed its foundation to the Phoenician colonists of the country. At any rate, the Punic deities retained their hold upon the place, the temples of the Tyrian Hercules and of Saturn, the scene of annual human sacrifices, were conspicuous in its outline, though these and all other religious buildings in it looked small beside the mysterious antique shrine devoted to the sensual rites of the Syrian Astarte, public baths and a theatre, a capital imitative of Rome, a gymnasium, the long outline of a portico, an equestrian statue in brass of the emperor Severus, were grouped together above the streets of a city, which, narrow and winding, ran up and down across the hill. In its centre an extraordinary spring threw up incessantly several tons of water every minute, and was enclosed by the superstitious gratitude of the inhabitants with the peristylium of a sacred place at the extreme back towards the north which could not be seen from the point of view where we last stationed ourselves there was a sheer descent of rock bestowing on the city when it was seen at a distance on the mediterranean side the same bold and striking appearance which attaches to castro giovanni the ancient enna in the heart of sicily and now withdrawing our eyes from the panorama whether in its distant or nearer objects if we would at length contemplate the spot itself from which we have been last surveying it we shall find almost as much to repay attention and to elicit admiration we stand in the midst of a farm of some wealthy proprietor consisting of a number of fields and gardens separated from each other by hedges of cactus or the aloe at the foot of the hill which sloped down on the side furthest from sicca to one of the tributaries of the rich and turbid river of which we have spoken a large yard or garden intersected with a hundred artificial rills was devoted to the cultivation of the beautiful and odoriferous kenna a thick grove of palms seemed to triumph in the refreshment of the water's side and lifted up their thankful boughs towards heaven the barley harvest in the fields which lay higher up the hill was over or at least was finishing and all that remained of the crop was the incessant and importunate chirping of the cicada and the rude booths of reed and bulrushes now left to wither in which the peasant boys found shelter from the sun while in an earlier month they frightened from the grain the myriad of linnets goldfinches and other small birds who as in other countries contested with the human proprietor the possession of it 
On the southwestern slope lies a neat and carefully dressed vineyard, the vine stakes of which, dwarfish as they are, already cast long shadows on the eastern side. Slaves are scattered over it, testifying to the scorching power of the sun by their broad potassus, and to its oppressive heat by the scanty subligarium, which reached from the belt or girdle to the knees. They are engaged in cutting off useless twigs, to which the last showers of spring have given birth, and are twisting those which promise fruit into positions where they will be safe both from the breeze and from the sun everything gives token of that gracious and happy season which the great latin poets have hymned in their beautiful but heathen strains when after the heavy rains and raw mists and piercing winds and fitful sun gleams of a long six months the mighty mother manifests herself anew and pours out the resources of her innermost being for the life and enjoyment of every portion of the vast whole or to apply the lines of a modern bard when the bare earth till now desert and bare unsightly unadorned brings forth the tender grass whose verdure clads her universal face with pleasant green then herbs of every leaf that sudden flower opening their various colours and make gay her bosom swelling sweet and these scarce blown forth flourishes the clustering vine forth creeps the swelling gourd up stands the corny reed embattled in her fields and the humble shrub and bush with frizzled hair implicit last rise as in dance the stately trees and spread their branches hung with copious fruit or gem their blossoms with high woods the hills are crowned with tufts the valleys and each fountain side with borders long the rivers that earth now seems like to heaven a seat where gods might dwell or wander with delight and love to haunt her sacred shades a snatch from some old greek chant with something of plaintiveness in the tone issues from the thicket just across the mule path cut deep in the earth which reaches from the city gate to the streamlet and a youth who had the appearance of the assistant bailiff or procurator of the farm leaped from it and went over to the labourers who were busy with the vines his eyes and hair and the cast of his features spoke of europe his manner had something of shyness and reserve rather than of rusticity and he wore a simple red tunic with half sleeves descending to the knee and tightened round him by a belt his legs and feet were protected by boots which came half up his calf he addressed one of the slaves and his voice was gentle and cheerful ah sansar he cried i don't like your way of managing these branches so well as my own but it is a difficult thing to move an old fellow like you you never fasten together the shoots which you don't cut off they are flying about quite wild and the first ox that passes through the field next month for the ploughing will break them off he spoke in latin the man understood it and answered him in the same language though with deviations from purity of accent and syntax not without parallel in the talky talky of the west indian negro ay ay master he said ay ay but it's all a mistake to use the plough at all the fork does the work much better and no fear for the grape i hide the tendril under the leaf against the sun which is the only enemy we have to consider ah but the fork does not raise so much dust as the plough and the heavy cattle which draw it returned agilius and the said dust does more for the protection of the tendril than the shade of the leaf but those huge beasts retorted the slave turn up great ridges and destroy the yard it's no good arguing with an old vine dresser who had formed his theory before i was born said agilius good-humouredly and he passed on into a garden beyond here were other indications of the happy month through which the year was now travelling the garden so to call it was a space of several acres in extent it was one large bed of roses and preparation was making for extracting their essence for which various parts of that country are to this day celebrated 
Here was another set of labourers, and a man of middle age was surveying them at his leisure. His business-like, severe, and off-hand manner bespoke the villicus or bailiff himself. Always here, said he, as if you were a slave, not a Roman, my good fellow. Yet slaves have their Saturnalia. Always serving, not worshipping the all-bounteous and all-blessed. Why are you not taking a holiday in the town? Why should I, sir? asked Agilius. Don't you recollect old Hiempsal's saying about one foot in the slipper and one in the shoe? Nothing would be done well if I were a town-goer. You engaged me, I suppose, to be here, not there. Ah, answered he, but at this season the empire, the genius of Rome, the customs of the country, demand it, and above all the great goddess Astarte, and her genial jocund month, parturit almus ager. You know the verse. Do not be out of tune with nature nor clash and jar with the great system of the universe a cloud of confusion or of distress passed over agilius's face he seemed as if he wished to speak at length he merely said it's a fault on the right side in a servant i suppose i know the way of your people vitricus replied corybantians phrygians jews Oh, what do you call yourselves? There are so many fantastic religions nowadays. Hang yourself outright at your house door, if you are tired of living. And you are a sensible fellow. How can any man whose head sits right upon his shoulders say that life is worth having and not worth enjoying? I am a quiet being, answered Agellius. I like the country, which you think so tame and care little for the flaunting town tastes differ town you need not go to sicca answered the bailiff all of sicca is out of town it has poured into the fields and groves and riverside lift up your eyes man alive open your ears and let pleasure flow in be passive under the sweet breath of the goddess and she will fill you with ecstasy it was as vitricus had said the solemn feast days of astarte were in course of celebration of astarte the well-known divinity of carthage and its dependent cities whom heliogabalus had lately introduced to rome who in her different aspects was at once urania juno and aphrodite according as she embodied the idea of the philosopher the statesman or the vulgar lofty and intellectual as urania majestic and commanding as juno seductive as the goddess of sensuality and excess there goes the son of as good and frank a soldier as ever brandished pilum said vitricus to himself till in his last years some infernal god took umbrage at him and saddled him and his with one of those absurd superstitions which are as plentiful here as serpents he indeed was too old himself to get much harm from it but it shows its sour nature in these young shoots a good servant but the plague's in his bones and he will rot his subordinates reflections were of a different character the very air breathes sin to-day he cried oh that i did not find the taint of the city in these works of god alas sweet nature the child of the almighty is made to do the fiend's work and does it better than the town o oh, ye beautiful trees and fair flowers o oh, bright sun and balmy air what a bondage ye are in and how do ye groan till you are redeemed from it ye are bond slaves but not willingly as man is but how will you ever be turned to nobler purpose how is this vast this solid establishment of error the incubus of many thousand years ever to have an end you yourselves dear ones will come to naught first anyhow the public way is no place for me this evening 
they'll soon be back from their accursed revelry the sound of horns and voices had been heard from time to time through the woods as if proceeding from parties dispersed through them and in the growing twilight might be seen lights glancing and wandering through the foliage the cottage in which agellius dwelt was on the other side of the hollow bridle-way which crossed the hill to make for home he had first to walk some little distance along it and scarcely had he descended into it for that purpose when he found himself in the front of a band of revellers who were returning from some scene of impious festivity they were arrayed in holiday guise as far as they studied dress at all the symbols of idolatry were on their foreheads and arms some of them were intoxicated and most of them were women why have you not been worshipping young fellow said one comely built said another but struck by the furies i know the cut of him by astarte said a third he's one of those sly gnostics i have seen the chap before with his hang-dog look he is one of pluto's whelps first cousin to cerberus and his name's chanibal on which they all began to shout out i say chanibal chanibal here is a lad that knows you old fellow come along with us and the speaker made a dash at him on this agellius who was slowly making his way past them on the broken and steep path leaped up in two or three steps to the ridge and went away in security when one woman cried out oh the toad i know him now he's a wizard he eats little children didn't you see him make that sign it's a charm my sister did it the fool left me to be one of them she was ever doing so mimicking the sign of the cross he's a christian blight him he'll turn us into beasts cerberus bite him said another he sucks blood and taking up a stone she made it whiz past his ear as he disappeared from view a general scream of contempt and hatred followed where's the ass's head put out the lights put out the lights chibbet him that's why he has not been with honest people down in the vale and then they struck up a blasphemous song the sentiments of which we are not going even to conceive much less to attempt in words end of chapter one chapter two of callista by john henry newman this librivox recording is in the public domain christianity in sicca the revellers went on their way agellius went on his and made for his lowly and lonely cottage he was the elder of the two sons of a roman legionary of the secunda italica who had settled with them in sicca where he lost their mother and died having in his old age become a christian the fortitude of some confessors at carthage in the persecution of severus had been the initial cause of his conversion he had been posted as one of their guards and had attended them to the scene of their martyrdom in addition to the civil force to whom in the proconsulate the administration of the law was committed therefore happily for him it could not fall to his duty to be their executioner a function which however revolting to his feelings he might not have had the courage to decline he remained a pagan though he could not shake off the impression which the martyrs had made upon him and after completing his time of service he retired to the protection of some great friends in sicca his brother's home already here he took a second wife of the old numidian stock and supported himself by the produce of a small piece of land which had been given to him for life by the imperial government if trial were necessary in order to keep alive the good seed which had been sown in his heart he found a never-failing supply of that article in the companion of his declining years in the heyday of her youth she might have been fitted to throw a sort of sunshine or rather torchlight on a military carouse but now when poor strabo a man well-to-do in the world looking for peace had fallen under her arts he found he had surrendered his freedom to a malignant profligate woman whose passions made her better company for evil spirits than for an invalided soldier 
indeed as time went on the popular belief which she rather encouraged went to the extent that she actually did hold an intercourse with the unseen world and certainly she matured in a hatred towards god and man which would naturally follow and not unnaturally betoken such intercourse the more then she inflicted on him her proficiency in these amiable characteristics the more he looked out for some consolation elsewhere and the more she involved herself in the guilt or the repute of unlawful art the more he was drawn to that religion where alone to commune with the invisible is to hold intercourse with heaven not with hell whether so great a trial supplied a more human inducement for looking towards christianity it is impossible to say most men certainly roman soldiers may be considered to act on mixed motives but so it was in fact that on his becoming in his last years a christian he found perhaps discovered to his great satisfaction that the church did not oblige him to continue or renew a tie which bound him to so much misery and that he might end his days in a tranquillity which his past life required and his wife's presence would have precluded he made a good end he had been allowed to take the blessed sacrament from the altar to his own home on the last time he had been able to attend the synaxis of the faithful and thus had communicated at least six months within his decease and the priest who anointed him at the beginning of his last illness also took his confession he died begging forgiveness of all whom he had injured and giving large alms to the poor this was about the year two thirty six in the midst of that long peace of the church which was broken at length by the decian persecution this peace of well-nigh fifty years had necessarily a peculiar and not a happy effect upon the christians of the proconsulate they multiplied in the greater and the maritime cities and made their way into positions of importance whether in trade or the governmental departments they extended their family connections and were on good terms with the heathen whatever jealousy might still be cherished against the christian name nevertheless individual christians were treated with civility and recognized as citizens though among the populace there would be occasions at the time of the more solemn pagan feasts when accidental outbursts might be expected of the antipathy latent in the community as we have been recording in the foregoing chapter men of sense however began to understand them better and to be more just to the reasonableness of their faith this would lead them to scorn christianity less but it would lead them to fear it more it was no longer a matter merely for the populace to insult but for the government deliberately to put down the prevailing and still growing unbelief among the lower classes of the population did but make a religion more formidable which as heathen statesmen felt was able to wield the weapons of enthusiasm and zeal with a force and success unknown even to the most fortunate impostors among the oriental or egyptian hierophants the philosophical schools were impressed with similar apprehensions and had now for fifty years been employed in creating and systematizing a new intellectual basis for the received paganism but while the signs of the times led to the anticipation that a struggle was impending between the heads of the state religion and of the new worship which was taking its place the great body of christians laymen and ecclesiastics were on better and better terms individually with the members of society or what is now called the public and without losing their faith or those embers of charity which favourable circumstances would promptly rekindle were it must be confessed in a state of considerable relaxation they often were on the brink of deplorable sins and sometimes fell over the brink and many would join the church on inferior motives as soon as no great temporal disadvantage attached to the act or the families of christian parents might grow up with so little of moral or religious education as to make it difficult to say why they called themselves members of a divine religion mixed marriages would increase both the scandal and the confusion a long repose says st cyprian speaking of this very period had corrupted the discipline which had come down to us every one was applying himself to the increase of wealth and forgetting both the conduct of the faithful under the apostles 
and what ought to be their conduct in every age with insatiable eagerness for gain devoted himself to the multiplying of possessions the priests were wanting in religious devotedness the ministers in entireness of faith there was no mercy in works no discipline in manners men wore their beards disfigured and women dyed their faces their eyes were changed from what god made them and a lying colour was passed upon their hair the hearts of the simple were misled by treacherous artifices and brethren became entangled in seductive snares ties of marriage were formed with unbelievers members of christ abandoned to the heathen not only rash swearing was heard but even false persons in high place were swollen with contemptuousness poisoned reproaches fell from their mouths and men were sundered by unabating quarrels numerous bishops who ought to be an encouragement and example to others despising their sacred calling engaged themselves in secular vocations relinquished their sees deserted their people strayed among foreign provinces hunted the markets for mercantile profits and tried to amass large sums of money while they had brethren starving within the church took possession of estates by fraudulent proceedings and multiplied their gains by accumulated usuries the relaxation which would extend the profession of christianity in the larger cities would contract or extinguish it in remote or country places there would be little zeal to keep up churches which could not be served without an effort or without secular loss carthage utica hippo milavis or curibus was a more attractive residence than the towns with uncouth african names which amazed the ecclesiastical student in the acts of the councils vocations became scarce sees remained vacant congregations died out this was pretty much the case with the church and see of sicca at the time of which we write history preserves no record of any bishop as exercising his pastoral functions in that city in matter of fact there was none the last bishop an amiable old man had in the course of years acquired a considerable extent of arable land and employed himself principally for lack of more spiritual occupation in reaping stacking selling and sending off his wheat for the roman market his deacon had been celebrated in early youth for his boldness in the chase and took part in the capture of lions and panthers an act of charity towards the peasants round sicca for the roman amphitheatre no priests were to be found and the bishop became parochus till his death afterwards infants and catechumens lost baptism parents lost faith or at least love wanderers lost repentance and conversion for a while there was a flourishing meeting-house of tertullianists who had scared more humble minds by pronouncing the eternal perdition of every catholic there had also been various descriptions of gnostics who had carried off the clever youth and restless speculators and then there had been the lapse of time gradually consuming the generation which had survived the flourishing old days of the african church and the result was that in the year 250 it was difficult to say of whom the church of sicca consisted there was no bishop no priest no deacon there was the old mansionarius or sacristan there were two or three pious women married or single who owed their religion to good mothers there were some slaves who kept to their faith no one knew how or why there were a vast many persons who ought to be catholics but were heretics or nothing at all or all but pagans and sure to become pagans on the ass there were agellius and his brother juba and how far these two had a claim to the christian name we now proceed to explain they were about the ages of seven and eight when their father died and they fell under the guardianship of their uncle whose residence at sicca had been one of the reasons which determined strabo to settle there this man being possessed of some capital drove a thriving trade in idols large and small amulets and the like instruments of the established superstition 
his father had come to carthage in the service of one of the assessors of the proconsul of the day and his son finding competition ran too high to give him prospect of remuneration in the metropolis had opened his statue shop in sicca those modern arts which enable an english town in this day to be so fertile in the production of ware of this description for the markets of the pagan east were then unknown and jucundus depended on certain artists whom he imported especially on two greek brother and sister who came from some isle on the asian coast for the supply of his trade he was a good-natured man self-indulgent positive and warmly attached to the reigning paganism both as being the law of the land and the vital principle of the state and while he was really kind to his orphan nephews he simply abominated as in duty bound the idiotic cant and impudent fee-fa-fum to which in his infallible judgment poor old strabo had betrayed his children he would have restored them you may be quite sure to their country and to their country's gods had they acquiesced in the restoration but in different ways these little chaps and he shook his head as he said it were difficult to deal with agellius had a very positive opinion of his own on the matter and as for juba though he had no opinion at all yet he had an equally positive aversion to have thrust on him by another any opinion at all even in favour of paganism he had remained in his catechumen state since he grew up because he found himself in it and though nothing would make him go forward in his profession of christianity no earthly power would be able to make him go back so there he was like a mule stuck fast in the door of the church and feeling a gratification in his independence of mind however whatever his profession might be still as time went on he plainly took after his stepmother renewed his intercourse with her after his father's death and at length went so far as to avow that he believed in nothing but the devil if even he believed in him it was scarcely safe however to affirm that the senses of this hopeful lad were his own agellius on the other hand when a boy of six years old had insisted on receiving baptism had perplexed his father by a manifestation of zeal to which the old man was a stranger and had made the good bishop lose the corn fleet which was starting for italy from his importunity to learn the catechism baptized he was confirmed communicated but a boy's nature is variable and by the time agellius had reached adolescence the gracious impulses of his childhood had in some measure faded away though he still retained his faith in its first keenness and vigour but he had no one to keep him up to his duty no exhortations no example no sympathy his father's friends had taken him up so far as this that by an extraordinary favour they had got him a lease for some years of the property which strabo a veteran soldier had held of the imperial government the care of this small property fell upon him and another more, and more serious charge was added to it the long prosperity of the province had increased the opulence and enlarged the upper class of sicca officials contractors and servants of the government had made fortunes and raised villas in the neighbourhood of the city natives of the place returning from rome or from provincial service elsewhere had invested their gains in long leases of state lands or of the farms belonging to the imperial res privata or privy purse and had become virtual proprietors of the rich fields or beautiful gardens in which they had played as children one of such persons who had had a place in the officium of the quaestor or rather procurator as he began to be called was the employer of agellius his property adjoined the cottage of the latter and having first employed the youth from recollection of his father he confided to him the place of under bailiff from the talents he showed for farm business such was his position at the early age of twenty-two but honourable as it was in itself and from the mode in which it was obtained no one would consider it adapted under the circumstances to counteract the religious languor and coldness which had grown upon him and in truth he did not know where he stood further than that he was firm in faith as we have said and had shrunk from a boy upwards from the vice and immorality which was the very atmosphere of sicca he might any day be betrayed into some fatal inconsistency 
which would either lead him into sin or oblige him abruptly to retrace his steps and find a truer and safer position he was not generally known to be a christian at least for certain though he was seen to keep clear of the established religion it was not that he hid so much as that the world did not care to know what he believed and that day there were many rites and worships which kept to themselves many forms of moroseness or misanthropy as they were considered which withdrew their votaries from the public ceremonial the catholic faith seemed to the multitude to be one of these it was only in critical times when some idolatrous act was insisted on by the magistrate that the specific nature of christianity was tested and detected then at length it was seen to differ from all other religious varieties by that irrational and disgusting obstinacy as it was felt to be which had rather suffer torments and lose life than submit to some graceful or touching or at least trifling observance which the tradition of ages had sanctioned end of chapter two chapter three of callista by john henry newman this librivox recording is in the public domain agellius in his cottage the cottage for which agellius was making when last we had sight of him was a small brick house consisting of one room with a loft over it and a kitchen on the side not very unlike that holy habitation which once contained the eternal word in human form with his virgin mother and joseph their guardian it was situated on the declivity of the hill and unlike the gardens of italy the space before it was ornamented with a plot of turf a noble palm on one side in spite of its distance from the water and a group of orange trees on the other formed a foreground to the rich landscape which was described in our opening chapter the borders and beds were gay with the lily the bacar amber-coloured and purple the golden abrotomus the red caledonium and the variegated iris against the wall of the house were trained pomegranates with their crimson blossoms the star-like pothos or jessamine and the symbolical passion flower which well became a christian dwelling and it was an intimation of what would be found within for on one side of the room was rudely painted a red cross with doves about it as is found in early christian shrines to this day so long had been the peace of the church that the tradition of persecution seemed to have been lost and christians allowed themselves in the profession of their faith at home cautious as they might be in public places as freely as now in england where we do not scruple to raise crucifixes within our churches and houses though we shrink from doing so within sight of the hundred cabs and omnibuses which rattle past them under the cross were two or three pictures or rather sketches in the centre stood the blessed virgin with hands spread out in prayer attended by the holy apostles peter and paul on her right and left under this representation was rudely scratched upon the wall the word advocata a title which the earliest antiquity bestows upon her on a small shelf was placed a case with two or three rolls or sheets of parchment in it the appearance of them spoke of use indeed but of reverential treatment these were the psalms the gospel according to st luke and st paul's epistle to the romans in the old latin version the gospel was handsomely covered and ornamented with gold the apartment was otherwise furnished with such implements and materials as might be expected in the cottage of a countryman one or two stools and benches for sitting a table and in one corner a heap of dried leaves and rushes with a large crimson coverlet for rest at night elsewhere were two millstones fixed in a frame with a handle attached to the rim of one of them for grinding corn then again garden tools a box of seeds a vessel containing syrup for assuaging the sting of a scorpion the azureza or anagallis a potent medicine of the class of poisons which was taken in wine for the same mischance it hung from the beams with a large bunch of atsirtifua a sort of chamomile smaller in the flower and more fragrant than our own which was used as a febrifuge thence too hung a plentiful gathering of dried grapes of the kind called duracine and near the door a bough of the green bargut or psyllium to drive away the smaller insects poor agellius felt the contrast between the ungodly turmoil from which he had escaped and the deep stillness into which he now had entered but neither satisfied him quite there was no repose out of doors and no relief within he was lonely at home 
lonely in the crowd he needed the sympathy of his kind hearts which might beat with his heart friends with whom he might share his joys and griefs advisers whom he might consult minds like his own who would understand him minds unlike his own who would succour and respond to him a very great trial certainly this in which the soul was flung back upon itself and that especially in the case of the young for whom memory and experience do so little and wayward and excited feelings do so much great gain had it been for agellius even in its natural effect putting aside its higher benefits to have been able to recur to sacramental confession but to confession he had never been though once or twice he had attended the public homologesis of the church shall we wonder that the poor youth began to be despondent and impatient under his trial shall we not feel for him though we may be sorry for him should it turn out that he was looking restlessly into every corner of the small world of acquaintance in which his lot lay for those with whom he could converse easily and interchange speculation argument aspiration and affection no one cares for me he said as he sat down on his rustic bench i am nothing to any one i am a hermit like elias or john without the call to be one <laughs> yet even elias felt the burden of being one against many even john asked at length in expostulation art thou he that shall come am i for ever to have the knowledge without the consolation of the truth am i for ever to belong to a great divine society yet never see the face of any of its members he paused in his thoughts as if drinking in the full taste and measure of his unhappiness and then his reflections took a turn and he said suddenly why do i not leave sicca what binds me to my father's farm i am young and my interest in it will soon expire what keeps me from carthage hippo kirtha where christians are so many but here he stopped as suddenly as he had begun and a strange feeling half pang half thrill went through his heart and he felt unwilling to pursue his thought or to answer the question which he had asked and he settled into a dull stagnant condition of mind in which he seemed hardly to think at all be of good cheer solitary one though thou art not a hero yet there is one that cares for thee and loves thee more than thou canst feel love or care for thyself cast all thy care upon him he sees thee and is watching thee he is hanging over thee and smiles in compassion at thy troubles his angel who is thine is whispering good thoughts to thee he knows thy weakness he foresees thy errors but he holds thee by thy right hand and thou shalt not canst not escape him by thy faith which thou hast so simply resolutely retained in the midst of idolatry by thy purity which like some fair flower thou hast cherished in the midst of pollution he will remember thee in thy evil hour and thine enemy shall not prevail against thee what means that smile upon agellius's face it is the response of the child to the loving parent he knows not why but the cloud is past he signs himself with the holy cross and sweet reviving thoughts enliven him he names the sacred name and it is like ointment poured out upon his soul he rises he kneels down under the dread symbol of his salvation and he begins his evening prayer end of chapter three chapter four of callista by john henry newman this librivox recording is in the public domain juba there was more of heart less of effort less of mechanical habit in agellius's prayers that night than there had been for a long while before he got up struck a light and communicated it to his small earthen lamp its pale rays feebly searched the room and discovered at the other end of it juba who had silently opened the door and sat down near it while his brother was employed upon his devotions the countenance of the latter fell 
for he was not to go to sleep with the resignation and peace which had just before been poured into his breast yet why should he complain we receive consolation in this world for the very purpose of preparing us against trouble to come juba was a tall swarthy wild-looking youth he was holding his head on one side as he sat and his face towards the roof he nodded obliquely arched his eyebrows pursed up his lips and crossed his arms while he gave utterance to a strange half-whispered laugh <laughs> he cried so you are on your knees agellius why shouldn't i be at this hour answered agellius and before i go to bed oh every one to his taste of course said juba but to an unprejudiced mind there is something unworthy in the act why juba said his brother somewhat sharply don't you profess any religion at all perhaps i do and perhaps i don't answered juba but never shall it be a bowing and scraping crawling and cringing religion you may take your oath of that what ails you to come here at this time of the night asked agellius who asked for your company i will come just when i please said the other and go when i please i won't give an account of my actions to any one god or man devil or priest much less to you what right have you to ask me then said agellius you'll never get peace or comfort as long as you live that i can tell you let alone the life to come juba kept silent for a while and bit his nails with a smile on his face and his eyes looking askance upon the ground i want no more than i have i am well content he said contented with yourself retorted agellius of course juba replied whom ought one to wish rather to content i suppose your creator creator answered juba tossing back his head with an air of superiority creator that i consider is an assumption oh my dear brother cried agellius don't go on in that dreadful way go on who began is one man to lay down the law and not the other too is it so generally received this belief of a creator who have brought in the belief the christians tis the christians that began it the world went on very well without it before their rise and now who began the dispute but you well if i did answered agellius but i didn't you began in coming here what in the world are you come for by what right do you disturb me at this hour there was no appearance of anger in juba he seemed as free from feeling of every kind from what is called heart as if he had been a stone in answer to his brother's question he quietly said i have been down there pointing in the direction of the woods an expression of sharp anguish passed over his brother's face and for a moment he was silent at length he said you don't mean to say you have been down to poor mother i do said juba there was again a silence for a little while then agellius renewed the conversation you have fallen off sadly juba in the course of the last several years juba tossed his head and crossed his legs at one time i thought you would have been baptized his brother continued that was my weakness answered juba it was a weak moment it was just after the old bishop's death he had been kind to me as a child and he said some womanish words to me and it was excusable in me oh, that you had yielded to your wish cried agellius juba looked superior the fit passed he said i have come to a juster view of things it is not every one who has the strength of mind i consider that a logical head comes to a very different conclusion and he began wagging his own to the right and left as if it were coming to a great many oh well said agellius gaping and desiring at least to come to a conclusion of the altercation what brings you here so late 
I was on my way to Jucundus, he answered, and have been delayed by the suck of Benoth in the grove across the river. Here they were thrown back upon their controversy. Agellius turned quite white. My poor fellow, he said, what were you there for? To see the world, answered Juba. It's unmanly not to see it. Why shouldn't I see it? It was good fun. I despise them all, fools and idiots. There they were, scampering about, or lying like hogs, all in liquor, apes and swine. However, I will do as others do if I please. I will be as drunk as they when I see good. I am my own master, and it would be no kind of harm. No harm? Why is it no harm to become an ape or a hog? You don't take just views of human nature, answered Juba, with a self-satisfied air. Our first duty is to seek our own happiness. If a man thinks it happier to be a hog, why, let him be a hog. And he laughed. This is where you are narrow-minded. I shall seek my own happiness and try this way, if I please. Happiness, cried Agellius. Where have you been picking up all this stuff? Can you call such detestable filth happiness? What do you know about such matters? answered Juba. Did you ever see them? Did you ever try them? You would be twice the man you are if you had. You will not be a man till you do. You are carried off your legs in your own way. I'd rather get drunk every day than fall down on all fours as you do, crawling on your stomach like a worm and whining like a hound that has been beaten. Now, as I live, you shan't stop here one instant longer, cried out Agellius, starting up. Be off with you. Get away. What do you come here to blaspheme for? Who wants you? Who asked for you? Go, go, I say. Take yourself off. Why don't you go? Keep your ribaldry for others. I am as good as you any day, said Juba. I don't set myself up, answered Agellius, but it's impossible to confound Christian and unbeliever as you do. Christian and unbeliever, said Juba slowly. I suppose when they are according each other, they are confounded. He looked hard at Agellius as if he thought he had hit a blot. Then he continued, if I were a Christian, I'd be so in earnest, else I'd be an honest heathen. Agellius colored somewhat and sat down as if under embarrassment. I despise you, said Juba. You have not the pluck to be a Christian. Be consistent and fizz upon a stake. But you're not made of that stuff. You're even afraid of uncle. <laughs> nay you can be caught by those painted wares about which when it suits your purpose you can be so grave i despise you he continued i despise you and the whole kit of you what's the difference between you and another your people say earth's a vanity life's a dream riches a deceit pleasure a snare fratres carissimi the time is short but who love earth and life and riches and pleasure better than they you are all of you as fond of the world as set upon gain as chary of reputation as ambitious of power as the jolly old heathen who you say is going the way of the pit it is one thing to have a conscience answered agellius another thing to act upon it the conscience of these poor people is darkened. You had a conscience once. Conscience? Hmm, conscience, said Juba. Yes, certainly, once I had a conscience. Yes, and once I had a bad chill, and went about chattering and shivering, and once I had a game leg, and then I went limping. And so you see, I once on a time had a conscience. Oh, yes, I have had many consciences before now white black yellow and green they were all bad but they are all gone and now i have none gellius said nothing his one wish as may be supposed was to get rid of so unwelcome a visitor the truth is continued juba with the air of a teacher the truth is that religion was a fashion with me 
which is now gone by it was the complexion of a particular stage of my life i was neither the better nor the worse for it it was an accident like the bloom on my face which soon he said spreading his fingers over his dirty coloured cheeks and stroking them which soon will disappear i acted according to the feeling while it lasted but i can no more recall it than my first teeth or the down on my chin it's among the things that were agellius still keeping silence from weariness and disgust he looked at him in a significant way and said slowly i see how it is i have penetration enough to perceive that you don't believe a bit more about religion than i do you must not say that under my roof cried agellius feeling he must not let his brother's charge pass without a protest many are my sins but unbelief is not one of them juba tossed his head i think i can see through a stone slab as well as any one he said it is as i have said but you are too proud to confess it it's part of your hypocrisy well said agellius coldly let's have done it's getting late juba you'll be missed at home jucundus will be inquiring for you and some of those revelling friends of yours may do you a mischief by the way why my good fellow he continued in surprise you have no leggings the scorpions will catch hold of you to a certainty in the dark come let me tie some straw wisps about you no fear of scorpions for me answered juba i have some real good amulets for the occasion which even bulacog and uffa will respect saying this he passed out of the room as unceremoniously as he had entered it and took the direction of the city talking to himself and singing snatches of wild airs as he went along throwing back and shaking his head and now and then uttering a sharp internal laugh disdaining to follow the ordinary path he dived down into the thick and wet grass and scrambled through the ravine which the public road crossed before it ascended the hill meanwhile he accompanied his quickened pace with a louder strain and it ran as follows the little black moor is the mate for me when the night is dark and the earth is free under the limbs of the broad yew tree twas father cham that planted the yew as he fed it fat with the bloody dew of a score of brats as his lineage grew footing and flaunting it all in the night each lock flings fire each heel strikes light no lamps need they whose breath is bright here he was interrupted by a sudden growl which sounded almost under his feet and some wild animal was seen to slink away juba showed no surprise he had taken out a small metal idol and whispering some words to it had presented it to the animal he clambered up the bank gained the city gate and made his way for his uncle's dwelling which was near the temple of astarte end of chapter four chapter five of callista by john henry newman this librivox recording is in the public domain jucundus at supper the house of jucundus was closed for the night when juba reached it or you would see were you his companion that it was one of the most showy shops in sicca it was the image store of the place and set out for sale not articles of statuary alone but of metal of mosaic work and of jewellery as far as they were dedicated to the service of paganism it was bright with many colours adopted in the embellishment of images and the many lights which silver and gold brass and ivory alabaster gypsum talc and glass reflected shelves and cabinets were laden with wares both the precious material and the elaborated trinket all tastes were suited the popular and the refined the fashion of the day and the love of the antique the classical and the barbarian devotion there you might see the rude symbols of invisible powers which originating in deficiency of art had been perpetuated by reverence for the past the mysterious cube of marble sacred among the arabs the pillar which was the emblem of mercury or bacchus the broad-based cone of heliogobalus the pyramid of paphos and the tile or brick of juno 
there too were the unmeaning blocks of stone with human heads which were to be dressed out in rich robes and to simulate the human form there were other articles besides as portable as these were unmanageable little junos mercuries dianas and fortunas for the bosom or the girdle household gods were there and the objects of personal devotion minerva or vesta with handsome niches or shrines in which they might reside there too were the brass crowns or nimbi which were intended to protect the heads of the gods from bats and birds there you might buy were you a heathen rings with heads on them of jupiter mars the sun serapis and above all astarte you would find there the rings and signets of the basilidians amulets too of wood or ivory figures of demons preternaturally ugly little skeletons and other superstitious devices it would be hard indeed if you could not be pleased whatever your religious denomination unless indeed you were determined to reject all the appliances and objects of idolatry indiscriminately and in that case you would rejoice that it was night when you arrived there and in particular that darkness followed up other appliances and objects of pagan worship which to darkness were due by a particular title and by darkness were best shrouded till the coming of that day when all things good and evil shall be made light the shop as we have said was closed concealed from view by large lumbering shutters and made secure by heavy bars of wood so we must enter by the passage or vestibule on the right side and that will conduct us into a modest atrium with an impluvium on one side and on the other the triclinium or supper-room backing the shop jucundus had been pleasantly engaged in a small supper-party and mindful that a symposium should lie within the number of the graces and of the muses he had confined his guests to two the young greek aristo who was one of his principal artists and cornelius the son of a freedman of a roman of distinction who had lately got a place in one of the screenia of the proconsular officium and had migrated into the province from the imperial city where he had spent his best days the dinner had not been altogether suitable to modern ideas of good living the grapes from tecape and the dates from the lake tritonus the white and black figs the nectarines and peaches and the watermelons addressed themselves to the imagination of an englishman as well as of an african of the third century so also might the liquor derived from the sap or honey of the getulian palm and the sweet wine called melilotus made from the poetical fruit found upon the coast of the syrtes he would have been struck too with the sweetness of the mutton but he would have asked what the sheep's tails were before he tasted them and found how like marrow the firm substance ate of which they consisted he would have felt he ought to admire the rows of mullets pressed and dried from martania but he would have thought twice before he tried the lion cutlets though they had the flavour of veal and the additional goat of being imperial property and poached from a preserve but when he saw the indigenous dish the very haggis and cockaliki of africa in the shape of alas alas it must be said with whatever apology for its introduction in shape then of a delicate puppy served up with tomatoes with its head between its forepaws we consider he would have risen from the unholy table and thought he had fallen upon the hospitality of some sorceress of the neighbouring forest however to that festive board our briton was not invited for he had some previous engagement that evening either of painting himself with woad or of hiding himself to the chin in the fens so that nothing occurred to disturb the harmony of the party and the good humour and easy conversation which was the effect of such excellent cheer cornelius had been present at the secular games in the foregoing year and was full of them of rome and of himself in connection with it as became so genuine a cockney of the imperial period he was full of the high patriotic thoughts which so solemn a celebration had kindled within him o oh, great rome he said thou art first and there is no second in that wonderful pageant which these eyes saw last year was embodied her majesty was promised her eternity we die she lives i say let a man die it's well for him to take hemlock or open a vein 
after having seen the secular games what was there to live for i felt it life was gone its best gifts flat and insipid after that great day excellent taromenian i suppose we know it in rome fill my cup i drink to the genius of the emperor he was full of his subject and soon resumed it fancy the campus martius lighted up from one end to the other it was the finest thing in the world a large plain covered not with streets not with woods but broken and crossed with superb buildings in the midst of groves avenues of trees and green grass down to the water's edge there's nothing that isn't fair do you want the grandest temples in the world the most spacious porticos the longest race courses there they are do you want gymnasia there they are do you want arches statues obelisks you find them there there you have at one end the stupendous mausoleum of augustus cased with white marble and just across the river the huge towering mound of hadrian at the other end you have the noble pantheon of agrippa with its splendid syracusan columns and its dome glittering with silver tiles hard by are the baths of alexander with their beautiful groves ah my good friend i shall have no time to drink if i go on beyond are the numerous chapels and fanes which fringe the base of the capitoline hill the tall column of antoninus comes next with its adjacent basilica where is kept the authentic list of the provinces of the empire and of the governors each a king in power and dominion who are sent out to them well i am now only beginning fancy i say this magnificent region all lighted up every temple to and fro every bath every grove gleaming with innumerable lamps and torches no not even the gods of olympus have anything that comes near it rome is the greatest of all divinities in the dead of night all was alive then it was when nature sleeps exhausted rome began the solemn sacrifices to commemorate her thousand years on the banks of the tiber which had seen aeneas land and romulus ascend to the gods the clear red flame shot up as the victims burned the music of ten thousand horns and flutes burst forth and the sacred dances began upon the greensward i am too old to dance but i protest even i stood up and threw off we danced through three nights dancing the old millinery out dancing the new millinery in we were all romans no strangers no slaves it was a solemn family feast the feast of all the romans then we came in for the feast said aristo for caracalla gave roman citizenship to all freemen all over the world we are all of us romans recollect cornelius ah oh, that was another matter a condescension answered cornelius yes in a certain sense i grant it but it was a political act i warrant you retorted aristo most political we were to be fleeced do you see so your imperial government made us romans that we might have the taxes of romans and that in addition to our own you've taxed us double and as for the privilege of citizenship much it is by hercules when every snob has it who can wear a pileus or cherish his hair ah but you should have seen the procession from the capital continued cornelius on i think the second day from the capital to the circus all down the via sacra hosts of strangers there and provincials from the four corners of the earth but not in the procession there you saw all in one coup d'oeil the real good blood of rome the young blood of the new generation and promise of the future the sons of patrician and consular families of imperators orators conquerors statesmen they rode at the head of the procession fine young fellows six abreast 
and still more of them on foot then came the running horses and the chariots the boxers the wrestlers and other combatants all ready for the competition the whole school of gladiators then turned out boys and all with their masters dressed in red tunics and splendidly armed they formed three bands and they went forward gaily dancing and singing the pyrrhic by the by a thousand pair of gladiators fought during the games a round thousand and such clean-made well-built fellows and they came against each other so gallantly you should have seen it i can't go through it there was a lot of satyrs jumping and frisking in burlesque of the martial dances which preceded them there was a crowd of trumpeters and horn-blowers ministers of the sacrifices with their victims bulls and rams dressed up with gay wreaths drivers butchers harispices heralds images of gods with their cars of ivory or silver drawn by tame lions and elephants i can't recollect the order oh but the grandest thing of all was the carmen sung by twenty-seven noble youths and as many noble maidens taken for the purpose from the bosoms of their families to propitiate the gods of rome the flamens augurs colleges of priests it was endless last of all came the emperor himself that's the late man observed jucundus philip no bad riddance his death if all's true that's said of him all emperors are good in their time and way answered cornelius philip was good then and decius is good now whom the gods preserve true said aristo i understand an emperor cannot do wrong except in dying and then everything goes wrong with him his death is his first bad deed he ought to be ashamed of it it somehow turns all his great virtues into vices ah no one was so good an emperor as our man gordianus said jucundus a princely old man living and dead patron of trade and of the arts such villas he had enormous revenues poor old gentleman and his son too i shall never forget the day when the news came that he was gone let me see it was shortly after that old fool strabo's death ah i mean my brother a good thirteen years ago all africa was in tears there was no one like gordianus that's old world philosophy said aristo jucundus you must go to school don't you see that all that is is right and all that was is wrong te nos facimus fortuna deam says your poet well i drink to the fortunes of rome while it lasts you're a young man answered cornelius a very young man and a greek greeks never understand rome it's most difficult to understand us it's a science look at this medal young gentleman it was one of those struck at the games is it not grand novum seculum and on the reverse eternitati always changing always imperishable emperors rise and fall rome remains the eternal city isn't this good philosophy truly a most beautiful medal said aristo examining it and handing it on to his host you might make an amulet of it jucundus but as to eternity why that is a very great word and if i mistake not other states have been eternal before rome ten centuries is a very respectable eternity be content rome is eternal already and may die without prejudice to the medal blaspheme not replied cornelius rome is healthier more full of life and promises more than at any former time you may rely upon it novum seculum she has the age of the eagle and will but cast her feathers to begin a fresh thousand but egypt interposed aristo if old herodotus speaks true scarcely had a beginning up and up the higher you go 
the more dynasties of egyptian kings do you find and we hear strange reports of the nations in the far east beyond the ganges but i tell you man rejoined cornelius rome is a city of kings that one city in this one year has as many kings at once as those of all the kings of all the dynasties of egypt put together sesostris and the rest of them what are they to imperators prefects proconsuls vicarii and rationales look back at lucullus caesar pompey sulla titus trajan what's old cheops pyramid to the flavian amphitheatre what is the many-gated thebes to nero's golden house while it was what the grandest palace of sesostris or ptolemy but a second-rate villa of any one of ten thousand roman citizens our houses stand on acres of ground they ascend as high as the tower of babylon they swarm with columns like a forest they pullulate into statues and pictures the walls pavements and ceilings are dazzling from the lustre of the rarest marble red and yellow green and mottled fountains of perfumed water shoot aloft from the floor and fish swim in rocky channels round about the room waiting to be caught and killed for the banquet we dine and we feast on the head of the ostrich the brains of the peacock the liver of the bream the milk of the morena and the tongue of the flamingo a flight of doves nightingales becaficos are concentrated into one dish on great occasions we eat a phoenix our saucepans are of silver our dishes of gold our vases of onyx and our cups of precious stones hangings and carpets of tyrian purple are around us and beneath us and we lie on ivory couches the choicest wines of greece and italy crown our goblets and exotic flowers crown our heads in come troops of dancers from lydia or pantomimes from alexandria to entertain both eye and mind or our noble dames and maidens take a place at our tables they wash in asses milk they dress by mirrors as large as fish ponds and they glitter from head to foot with combs brooches necklaces collars earrings armlets bracelets finger rings girdles stomachers and anklets all of diamond and emerald our slaves may be counted by thousands and they come from all parts of the world everything rare and precious is brought to rome the gum of arabia the nard of assyria the papyrus of egypt the citron wood of mauritania the bronze of aegina the pearls of britain the cloth of gold of phrygia the fine webs of kos the embroidery of babylon the silks of persia the lion skins of gatulia the wool of miletus the plaids of gaul thus we live an imperial people who do nothing but enjoy themselves and keep festival the whole year and at length we die and then we burn we burn in stacks of cinnamon and cassia and in shrouds of asbestos making emphatically a good end of it such are we romans a great people why we are honoured wherever we go there's my master there's myself as we came here from italy i protest we were nearly worshipped as demigods and perhaps some fine morning said aristo rome herself will burn in cinnamon and cassia and in all her burnished corinthian brass and scarlet bravery the old mother following her children to the funeral pyre one has heard something of babylon and its drained moat and the soldiers of the persian a pause occurred in the conversation as one of eucundus's slaves entered with fresh wine larger goblets and a vase of snow from the atlas end of chapter five chapter six of callista by john henry newman this librivox recording is in the public domain goths and christians cordelius was full of his subject and did not attend to the greek the wild beast hunts he continued ah those hunts during the games aristo they were a spectacle for the gods twenty-two elephants ten panthers ten hyenas by the by a new beast not strange however to you here i suppose 
ten camelopards, a hippopotamus, a rhinoceros. Oh, I can't go through the list. Fancy the circus planted throughout for the occasion and turned into a park and then another set of wild animals geats and sarmatians celts and goths sent in against them to hunt down capture and kill them or to be killed themselves ah the goths answered aristo those fellows give you trouble though now and then perhaps they will give you more there is a report in the praetorium to-day that they have crossed the danube yes they will give us trouble said cornelius dryly they have given us trouble and they will give us more the samnites gave us trouble and our friends of carthage here and jugurtha and mithridates trouble yes that is the long and the short of it they will give us trouble is trouble a new thing to rome he asked stretching out his arm as if he were making a speech after dinner and giving a toast the goths give trouble and take a bribe retorted aristo this is what trouble means in their case it's a troublesome fellow who hammers at our door till we pay his reckoning it is troublesome to raise the means to buy them off and the example of these troublesome savages is catching it was lately rumoured that the carpians had been asking the same terms for keeping quiet it would ill become the majesty of rome to soil her fingers with the blood of such vermin said cornelius she ignores them and therefore she most majestically bleeds us instead answered aristo that she may have treasure to give them we are not so troublesome as they the more's the pity no offence to you however or to the emperor or to great rome cornelius we are over our cups it is only a game of politics you know like chess or the catabus maro bids you parcere subjectis adebelare superbos but you have changed your manners you coax the goths and bully the poor african africa can show fight too interposed jucundus who had been calmly listening and enjoying his own wine witness thisdrus that was giving every rapacious quaestor a lesson that he may go too far and find a dagger when he demands a purse he was alluding to the revolt of africa which led to the downfall of the tyrant maximin and the exaltation of the gordians when the native landlords armed their peasantry killed the imperial officer and raised a standard of rebellion in the neighbouring town from impatience of exactions under which they suffered no offence i say cornelius no offence to eternal rome said aristo but you have explained to us why you weigh so heavy on us i have always heard it was a fortunate rome for a man to have found out a new tax the spacian did his best but now you tax our smoke and our very shadow and pescennius threatened to tax the air we breathe we'll play at riddles and you shall solve the following say who is she that eats her own limbs and grows eternal upon them <laughs> ah the goths will take the measure of her eternity the goths said jucundus who was warming into conversational life the goths no fear of the goths but and he nodded significantly look at home we have more to fear indoors than abroad he bids the praetorians said cornelius to aristo condescendingly i grant you that there have been several untoward affairs we have had our problem but it's a thing of the past it never can come again i venture to say that the power of the praetorians is at an end that murder of the two emperors the other day was the worst job they ever did it has turned the public opinion of the whole world against them i have no fear of the praetorians i don't mean praetorians more than goths said jucundus no give me the old weapons the old maxims of rome and i defy the scythe of saturn do the soldiers march under the old ensign do they swear by the old gods 
do they interchange the good old signals and watchwords do they worship the fortune of rome then i say we are safe but do we take to new ways do we trifle with religion do we make light of jupiter mars romulus the augurs and the ancilia then i say not all our shows and games our elephants hyenas and hippopotamuses will do us any good it was not the best thing no not the best thing that the soldiers did when they infested that philip with the purple but he is dead and gone and he sat up and leaned on his elbow ah oh, but it will be all set right now said cornelius you'll see he'd be a reformer that philip continued jucundus and put down an enormity well they call it an enormity let it be an enormity he'd put it down but why there's the point why it's no secret at all and his voice grew angry that that hoary-headed atheist fabian was at the bottom of it fabian the christian i hate reforms well we had long wished to do it answered cornelius but could not manage it alexander attempted it near twenty years ago it's what philosophers have always aimed at the gods consume philosophers and the christians together said jucundus devoutly there is little to choose between them except that the christians are the filthier animal of the two but both are ruining the most glorious political structure that the world ever saw i am not over-fond of alexander either thank you in the name of philosophy said the greek and thank you in the name of the christians chimed in juba oh, that's good cried jucundus the first word that hopeful youth has spoken since he came in and he takes on him to call himself a christian ay i've a right to do so if i choose said juba i've a right to be a christian right oh yes right ha ha answered jucundus right jove help the lad by all manner of means of course you have the right to go in malam rem in whatever way you please i am my own master said juba my father was a christian i suppose it depends on myself to follow him or not according to my fancy and as long as i think fit fancy think fit answered jucundus you pompous little mule yes go and be a christian my dear child as your doting father went go like him to the priest of their mysteries be spit on stripped dipped feed on little boys marrows and brains worship the ass and learn all the foul magic of the sect and then be delated and taken up and torn to shreds on the rack or thrown to the lions and so go to tartarus if tartarus there be in the way you think fit you'll harm none but yourself my boy i don't fear such as you but the deeper heads juba stood up with a look of offended dignity and as on former occasions tossed the head which had been by implication disparaged i despise you he said well but you are hard on the christians said aristo i have heard them maintain that their superstition if adopted would be the salvation of rome they maintain that the old religion is gone or going out that something new is wanted to keep the empire together and that their worship is just fitted to the times all i say to the vipers said jucundus is let well alone we did well enough without you we did well enough till you sprang up a plague on their insolence as if jew or egyptian could do aught for us when numa and the sibyl fail that is what i say let rome be true to herself and nothing can harm her let her shift her foundation and i would not buy her for this watermelon he said taking a suck at it rome alone can harm rome recollect old horace sui set ipsa roma viribus ruit he was a prophet if she falls it is by her own hand i agree said cornelius certainly to set up any new worship is treason not a doubt of it the gods keep us from such ingratitude we have grown great by means of them 
and they are part and parcel of the law of rome but there is no great chance of our forgetting this decius won't that's a fact you will see time will show perhaps to-morrow perhaps next day he added mysteriously why in the world should you have this frantic dread these poor scarecrows of christians said aristo all because they hold an opinion why are you not afraid of the bats and the moles it's an opinion there have been other opinions before them and there will be other opinions after let them alone and they'll die away make a hubbub about them and they'll spread spread cried jucundus who was under the twofold excitement of personal feeling and of wine spread they'll spread yes they'll spread yes grow like scorpions twenty at a birth the country already swarms with they are as many as frogs or grasshoppers they start up everywhere under one's nose when one least expects them the air breathes them like plague flies the wind drifts them like locusts no one's safe any one may be a christian it's an epidemic great joe i may be a christian before i know where i am heaven and earth is it not monstrous he continued with increasing fierceness yes eucundus my poor man you may wake and find yourself a christian without knowing it against your will ah my friends pity me i may find myself a beast and obliged to suck blood and live among the tombs as if i liked it without power to tell you how i loathe it all through their sorcery by the genius of rome something must be done i say no one is safe you call on your friend he is sitting in the dark unwashed uncombed undressed what is the matter ah his son has turned christian your wedding day is fixed you are expecting your bride she does not come why she will not have you she has become a christian where is young nomentanus who has seen nomentanus in the forum or the campus in the circus in the bath has he caught the plague or got a sunstroke nothing of the kind the christians have caught hold of him young and old rich and poor my lady in her litter and her slave modest maid and lydia at the thermae nothing comes amiss to them all confidence is gone there's no one we can reckon on i go to my tailor's nergal i say to him nergal i want a new tunic the wretched hypocrite bows and runs to and fro and unpacks his stuffs and cloths like another man a word in your ear the man's a christian dressed up like a tailor they have no dress of their own if i were emperor i'd make the sneaking curs wear a badge i would a dog's collar a fox's tail or a pair of ass's ears then we should know friends from foes when we meet them we should think that dangerous said cornelius however you are taking it too much to heart you are making too much of them my good friend they have not even got the present and you are giving them the future which is just what they want if jucundus will listen to me said aristo i could satisfy him that the christians are actually falling off they once were numerous in this very place now there are hardly any they have been declining for these fifty years the danger from them is past do you want to know how to revive them put out an imperial edict forbid them denounce them do you want them to drop away like autumn leaves take no notice of them i can't deny that in italy they have grown said cornelius they have grown in numbers and in wealth and they intermarry with us thus the upper class becomes to a certain extent infected we may find it necessary to repress them but as you would repress vermin without fearing them the worshippers of the gods are the many and the christians are the few persisted aristo if the two parties intermarry the weaker will get the worst of it you will find the statues of the gods gradually creeping back into the christian chapel and a man must be an honest fellow who buys our images eh eucundus well aristo said the pater familius whose violence never lasted long if your sister's bright eyes win back my poor agellius you will have something more to say for yourself than at present i grant 
i see said cornelius gravely i begin to understand it i could not make out why our good host had such great fear for the stability of rome but it is one of those things which the experience of life has taught me i have often seen it in the imperial city itself whenever you find a man show special earnestness against these fanatics depend upon it there is something that touches him personally in the matter there was a very great man the present flamen dialis for whom i have unbounded respect for a long time i was at a loss to conceive why a person of his weight sound sensible well judging should have such a fear of the christians one day he made an oration against them in the senate house he wanted to send them to the rack but the secret came out the good man was on the rack himself about his daughter who persisted in calling herself a christian and refused to paint her face or go to the amphitheatre to be sure a most trying affair this for the old gentleman the venerable pater patratus too huh, what suppers he gave a fine specimen of the lucullus type yet he was always advocating the lictor and the commentariensis in the instance of the christian no wonder his wife and son were disgracing him in the eyes of the whole world by frequenting the meetings of these christians however i agree with decius they must be put down they are not formidable but they are an eyesore here the rushing of the water-clock which measured time in the neighbouring square ceased signifying thereby that the night was getting on juba had already crept into the dark closet which served him for a sleeping place had taken off his sandals and loosened his belt had wrapped the serpent he had about him round his neck and was breathing heavily jucundus made the parting libation and cornelius took his leave aristo rose too and jucundus accompanying them to the entrance paid the not uncommon penalty of his potations for the wine mounted to his head and he returned into the room and sat him down again with an impression that aristo was still at the table my dear boy he said agellius is but a wet christian that's all not obstinate like his brother there twas his father the less we say about him the better he's gone the furies make his bed for him an odious set they're priests little ugly men i saw one when i was a boy at carthage so unlike your noble roman saliaris or your fine portly priest of isis clad in white breathing odours like spring flowers men who enjoy this life not like that sour hypocrite he was as black as an ethiopian and as withered as a saracen and he never looked you in the face and after all the fellow must die for his religion rather than put a few grains of golden incense on the altar of great jove jove's the god for me a glorious handsome curly god but they're all good all the gods are good there's bacchus he's a good comfortable god though a sly treacherous fellow a treacherous fellow <laughs> there's ceres too pomona the muses astarte too as they call her here all good and apollo though he's somewhat too hot in this season and too free with his bow he gave me a bad fever once life's precious most precious so i felt it then when i was all but gone to pluto life never returns it's like water spilt you can't gather it up it's dispersed into the elements to the four winds now well, there's something more there than i can tell more than all your philosophers can determine he seemed to think a while and began again enjoyment's the great rule ask yourself have i made the most of things that's what i say to the rising generation many and many's the time when i have not turned them to the best account oh if i had now to begin life again how many things should i correct i might have done better this evening those abominable pears i might have known they would not be worth the eating mutton that was all well doves good again crane kid well i don't see that i could have done much better 
After a few minutes he got up, half asleep, and put out all the lights but one small lamp, with which he made his way into his own bed-closet. All is vanity, he continued with a slow, grave utterance. All is vanity, but eating and drinking. It does not pay to serve the gods except for this. What's fame? What's glory? What's power? Smoke. I've often thought the hog is the only really wise animal. We should be happier if we were all hogs. Hogs keep the end of life steadily in view. That's why those toads of Christians will not eat them lest they should get like them. Quiet, respectable, sensible enjoyment. Not riot or revel or excess or quarrelling. Life is short. And with his undeniable sentiment he fell asleep. End of chapter 6